Many of you have heard about phosgene, a deadly gas used as a chemical weapon in World War I. It was responsible for around 85% of the total 90,000 deaths which were associated with gas attacks. But how many of you have heard about phosgene's big brother, triphosgene, and how it is used in pharmaceutical synthesis? Triphosgene was first described in 1888 when it was produced through photochlorination of dimethyl carbonate, a method still used for its production today. It then remained relatively unknown until the 1980s, where it started being used as a substitute for phosgene. At first glance, triphosgene does not appear chemically related to phosgene. However, it can react with moisture or heat to produce free equivalents of phosgene. The trichloromethyl groups are electronically similar to the chlorine atoms in triphosgene and can act as leaving groups, which produces an equivalent of phosgene. Unlike phosgene, which is a gas, or diphosgene, which is a liquid, Triphosgene is a crystallized solid, making it easier and safer to handle and lending itself to use as a phosgene substitute. But why would chemists want to use phosgene anyway? Phosgene is one of the few reagents where a carbonyl group is bonded to two excellent leaving groups. This property allows it to act as a dielectrophile and introduce an unsubstituted carbonyl group. This reaction is useful in medicinal chemistry and drug discovery to create bonds such as ureas and carbamates. Triphosgene can also be used in cyclization reactions to form ring systems, as demonstrated in the synthesis of FFRNs, a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor used to prevent and treat HIV. In this case, triphosgene is used to insert a carbonyl group between the alcohol and the aniline group, creating a six-membered cyclic carbamate. Another example is in the synthesis of ritonavir, where triphosgene is used in two sequential steps. The first step involves creating an oxazilidine dione of valine. This is a useful trick that helps overcome the problem of using unprotected amino acids in amide couplings. Normally, if you were to take valine and activate it with an amide coupling reagent, it would react with itself and start to form a polymeric mess. This is why protecting groups in the amino group are necessary. However, in this case, the oxazilidine dione structure serves the dual purpose of protecting the amino group and activating the acid in the single step. This allows for the aniline to attack the more electrophilic carbonyl and form an amide bond in the process. The product then undergoes a second reaction with triphosgene and a secondary amine, leading to the formation of the urea product. Triphosgene was also employed in the original synthesis of estipitant a compound developed by GSK which is being investigated for relieving the nausea and vomiting caused by chemotherapy. When screening for reagents, including other phosgene substitutes like CDI and bis carbonate, triphosgene proved to be the only effective option, giving better yields than phosgene itself. However, as production increased, there were safety concerns regarding the use of triphosgene on this scale. Triphosgene has previously been labelled as safe phosgene, but this is misleading. There are two main safety concerns with triphosgene. First is its breakdown to phosgene, either during reactions or if not handled properly during storage. The second concern is related to the toxicity of triphosgene itself. Like any other highly reactive electrophile, triphosgene is likely to cause toxicity by reacting with nucleophilic residues of proteins in the body. Research has shown that triphosgene is at least as dangerous as phosgene. Although it is a solid, this vapor pressure is low enough for sublimation to occur, which can lead to dangerous concentrations of triphosgene in the air. In the development of this route, the researchers tried using a little-known set of conditions involving carbon dioxide and phenyl chloride to convert the amine into a carbamyl chloride. This carbamyl chloride could then be used as an intermediate in the synthesis of the urea group. These conditions worked, although they gave inconsistent yields. The proposed mechanism for this reaction involves the amine being in equilibrium with its carboxylated salt, which can then react with phenyl chloride. To shift this equilibrium to the right, the chemists use TMS chloride to trap the carboxylate salt and push the first step to completion. This resulted in much higher and more consistent yields. Thank you for watching. If you found the information in this video useful or interesting, it'd be great if you could give this video a like as it's the best way you can help support the channel. Papers used will be linked in the description, and if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Also, I'll be doing a giveaway once we reach 1,000 subscribers, so stay tuned if you want to hear more about that.